So just as we're looking at Solomon tonight, Lord, and the prayers went up and the glory came down. So we pray for your blessing on this night. Go before us, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love that song. Hey, what's up? Good to have you guys. Hi, hi. Good. Second Chronicles, please. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Chapter 5. So Second Chronicles chapter 5. We left off at verse 1 where we saw that all the work was completed. Solomon did all the work. Obviously, he didn't do all the work, right? <laughs> he had a couple people helping him. And, um, and the work was finished. And we see in the first verse that Solomon brought the things which his father David had dedicated, the silver, the gold, all the furnishings. He put them in the treasuries of the houses of God. And verse 2 now is where we pick up in the story. It says, now Solomon... He assembled all the elders, got all the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel in Jerusalem, that they might bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord up from the city of David, which is Zion. So Solomon now calls for the Ark of the Covenant to come up and to be placed into the temple. And uh, it says, therefore, all the men of uh, Israel assembled with the king at the feast, which was in the seventh month. So all the elders of Israel came. And the Levites took up the ark, right? Only the Levites can carry the ark of God, right? That's their job. Nobody else can touch it, right? What happens when other people touch it? Eh, they die, right? So, you know. Or they touch it in the wrong way, right? I mean, it's, God is holy, right? Right? We can't just be cavalier with God. God is a holy God. So... They brought up the ark, the tabernacle of meeting, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle now is all going into the temple, okay? It's a relocation project, right? And the priests and the Levites brought them up. Again, it's, it's, it's over and over again, making it very sure that we understand only the priests can bring in the articles that belong into the temple, right? So what's interesting with verse 5 in the last verse there is that this is the last time priests carry the ark. It's the last time. It's coming into its permanent home, so to speak. The ark of the covenant. Before the ark of the covenant traveled around place to place, God would lead them, right? But now the ark is at its uh, final resting place. Verse 6 says, also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him before the ark. Notice the first thing that they do, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for multitude. We're going to see how the temple is made for worship, sacrifice. That's, that's one of the reasons why the temple is made. And we're also going to see praise and worship. But it says there that they were sacrificing. Then the priest brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place into the inner sanctuary of the temple to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. So they, they bring in the Ark now. They place it. Um, uh, they bring the Ark in and it's placed now under the wings of the cherubim. It says the cherubim spread their wings over the place of the Ark and the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles okay so remember what we spoke about that's a place of mercy it's called the mercy seat and the poles it says extended so that the ends of the poles of the ark could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary but they could not be seen from outside and they are to this day so it's interesting that uh, we're seeing now from the holy place we're looking into the holy of holies for the last time really except for the high priest that can go in there once a year but now we're seeing the the poles now here the final look is is of the ark is the poles and what do you think that would be that's the final place of 
the resting of the Ark of the Covenant and the Levites brought the Ark in. And so from looking, uh, so, so if you're looking at the Holy of Holies this way, here you, here we see the Ark of the Covenant and the last thing that you see are the poles. Man's last touch, so to speak, of the Ark. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty interesting thing. That from looking at from the holy place, that's, that's the last thing that they're seeing. So the, the untouchable God who dwells behind that veil, the veil is about to be closed, so to speak. And it's the last thing that they're seeing, that it's going to be closed off to man, the unapproachable God, except for who? Except when Jesus comes. And then we're able to approach God because of Christ. We can enter into the Holy of Holies because of Jesus Christ. So, verse 10 says something very interesting. It says, nothing was in the ark, the box, so to speak. Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they had come out of Egypt. So, saying here, according to the chronicler, that only the two tablets, the Ten Commandments, um, Exodus 20, are in that ark. The Ten Commandments was, a, again, a covenant between God and man. Okay, it's a covenant. In um, Exodus 20, verse 2, what does it say? It says that, there you go. That's all right. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Exodus 22, right? So God is God. And he's the one who brought them out, brought them out of Egypt. Man was now being charged to follow God, right? Here's the covenant that God is making with man. Okay, I am God. I am the God who brought you out of Egypt, out of, the land, out of the land of Egypt. And you shall, verse 3 says, you shall have no other gods before me. Again, the, there's a covenant now that God enters into Israel. Enters into, with Israel, a, a covenant. The covenant is, you know, between two parties. So it's between God and man. Here you have to keep the rules and the regulations. Right? And here they are. You shall, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay? Verse 4. You shall, make, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Right? Verse 7 says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. And down at verse 12. Honor your, your father and your mother so that you live long. That's true today, right? When you want to just want to slug your kid, right? You just take them out, right? Want to live long? Oh, honor me. <laughs> uh, verse 13, shall not murder. Verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Verse 15, you shall not steal. Verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And verse 17 says you shall not covet. Well, we do this, right? We, we do this. We have no problems with this, right? We all keep the commandments, right? Keep the Ten Commandments. You've heard people say, oh, I keep all the commandments. No, you don't. No, you don't. We don't do very well with keeping these commandments. We, we fall short of the glory of God, right? All have sinned, right? The Bible says, fall short of the glory of God. So when it, when it comes to these rules and regulations that God has entered into with man, with the nation of Israel, Ten Commandments, we don't do very well. We're not so great at keeping it. The law is a judgment against us. What the law does is tell us that we're, we're terribly sinful people. And we don't keep the law, right? Now what's interesting in Hebrews chapter 9, at verse 3, it says that behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of holies, the Hebrew writer writes this. He says, which had the golden center and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod, 
and the tablets of the covenant and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. So according to the Hebrew writer, we learned something else, that it wasn't only the two tabernacles, the, the two tablets. It's also the pot of manna and Aaron's budded rod. Now when, you know, when you're looking at the, the, Ark, of the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle, in the, in the temple, um, when you're looking at that, you've got to understand that Everything that's inside the Ark of the Covenant is it's all judgment-based. They're all judgment-based things that are in the Ark. All right? So we looked at the Ten Commandments already. It's a picture of judgment. We all fall short of the glory of God. Inside there is the rules and the regulations. We all fall short. Also within that Ark is also the, um, the manna. The manna that God provided to the nation of Israel. In in Numbers chapter 16, they started to complain. Nation of Israel started to complain. They started to whine. They They were tired of this manna that was there every morning. Even though God was providing for them in the wilderness, they got tired of God's provision. As oftentimes we sometimes do. Why can't he give me more? Why, you know... Well, it's enough to eat today and have a cup of coffee and, you know, you're doing pretty good compared to a lot of the world, right? Even if the bagels and the, and the, uh, the donuts are hard. It's still, a, it's still a blessing, right? That's what I'm getting at. But the nation of Israel complained against God. Even though every morning they got up, there was food, all right? They, they, could, they had, you know, manicot, they had manicotti, they had manna you know, manna burgers, you know, manana bread. I mean, every, you can make different things with the manana, manana every morning, right? They ate, they ate pretty good, but they still complained. Why, what did they complain? We're, we're tired of this manna. We want, we want meat. We want meat. You remember that story in number 16? God said, okay, you want meat? <laughs> God sent so much quail flying into the, into the company of Israel. He sent so much quail, so much bird. They pigged out. They pigged out. And then all of a sudden, oh, they got pigged out. And they got so sick. Remember, it was coming through their teeth. They were so disgusted with it. They were sick. They were just so... God said, okay, you're not going to like the manna that I provide? Okay, I'll give you meat. So God gave them what they wanted. And it made them nauseous. And it made them sick. And so forever in the ark would also be the manna. The manna was a, it's a picture of judgment against their complaining. Also in the ark of the covenant was what? The, the Aaron's budded rod. The budded rod. It's also a picture of judgment in that ark. Because you see, the nation of Israel started to complain against Moses and Aaron. Why, why do you guys have to lead us? Who made you guys the rulers over us? And it was God who chose Moses and Aaron to lead the nation of Israel out of Egypt. It was God's appointment of Moses and Aaron to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. But what did they do? They started to complain. Why? Is only Aaron and Moses and Aaron allowed to lead us? Why can't we lead? And you remember the, there was a guy by the name of Korah. Korah led a rebellion against Moses and Aaron. And it was then that God said, okay, how about all the 12 tribes take a, a staff, a stick, and write your name of your, of your tribe on the stick, and we're going to set it before the Lord, and in the morning, we're going to see who, who God supernaturally chose to lead the nation of Israel. All the 11 tribes, nothing happened except for what? The tribe that had Levi on it. The stick that had Levi on it. And what did that staff do? It budded and it produced almond. What? Above the ark sat what? The mercy seat. The mercy seat. 
So in spite of how far the nation of Israel falls, the ark represents, on top of it, mercy. Jesus Christ is our mercy seat. We all break the commandments, don't we? I don't want to, but in this wretched flesh that I find myself, I still fall short of God's glory. We all complain against God at times about his provision for our lives, don't we? We don't want to fall short when it seems he's no longer working for us, but we do. We whine against his people that he sends us to correct us at times like they did against Moses and Aaron. We want to at times hear and obey those who speak and, you know, we want to obey, but a lot of times we don't, right? We listen to somebody say something. We may listen to a message or we may hear something on the radio and we go, eh, you know, we poo-poo that. Even when it's biblical direction that comes to us, we still complain. We're horrible, ain't we? Yet for Jesus Christ, amen? For his grace. Now, yes, we're under grace, but does that give us the license to sin? No, of course not. Of course not. Even though God gives us grace, the mercy seat, it, doesn't, it does, shouldn't give us license to sin. We, we learn that in Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? And Paul said, No, certainly not. Certainly not. How should we who died to sin live any longer in it? You see, because when we understand what, what we have passed through, the judgment that we should have gotten, we're not getting because of the grace of God. And that's the very thing. When you understand what God has given you in his grace, that should just drive us to, be, to, to just hate sin. It should drive us to say, I want to be better for the Lord. I want this out of my life. I want that out of my life. I, I want to be more holy. Even though we'll never be perfectly holy, but we strive for that holiness. Well, back in chapter 5, verse 11, the ark is revealed to us, and we're given the scene at the temple. And it's a beautiful scene. When you look at verse 11, what's happening now that the Ark of the Covenant has been brought into the Holy of Holies. It says that it came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place, parentheses, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions. They were all sanctified. They all set themselves apart for this special day. And the Levites, who were the singers, okay, so the Levites had all kinds of different jobs, right? taking care of the tabernacle, transportation of the things, taking care of this and that, whatever, outside, sacrifice, sacrificing animals. And also, not only that, but some of them were singers. Remember, there was the worship team. Some of the Levites were worshipers, worship team. Now it says there, verse 12, the Levites who were the singers, all those of Asaph and Heman and Jedithan, with their sons and their brethren, Okay, so the worship team, they stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having what? Cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. So the chronicler is giving this picture of what's happening at the temple. It wasn't like this dour... Uh, Time, you know, it, was, it was loud and it was rocking man and they were singing with all their hearts that you know that's what church is supposed to be you know this place should be loud you know when we come together to worship God because he's so worthy his presence is there it's here and indeed it came to pass it says in verse 13 when the trumpeters and singers we're as one, okay? So when we gather as a church, we're together as one to celebrate the Lord. It says they, they were gathered together as one to make what? To make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, right? Just praising him and thanking him for who he is. And when they, notice, all of them lifted 
up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praise the Lord, they said this. So this was the song. What was the song? It was a short song. He is good for his mercy endures forever. Amen? I mean, that's what they sang. They were just like, I can't believe it. They're looking back at their past. They're looking back at their exodus from Egypt. They're, they're now in the promised land. They're now in the place where God said, this is where I want the temple. They're celebrating. They're worshiping the Lord. And all of a sudden, this song breaks out. He is good. His mercy endures forever. Just what a great, I, I just, I, that, this is one scene I wish I was at. Finally, the dedication of the temple to God. And what happens then? It happens at that moment that the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. It's filled with a cloud. The presence of God comes down and, and fills the place so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. Wouldn't that be awesome? If we're, if we're here one day and we're just worshiping the Lord, and we, just, we can't even worship anymore. There's no words to say. His, his presence is so thick that they, they, just, they just stop. And they're just blown away by God's presence. Wouldn't that be awesome? They're just so, they're just so enamored. And they couldn't minister because of, the, because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house. Check that out. The glory of the Lord just completely filled the house. We are the temple of God. When Romans was written by Paul, again, when, don't ever forget who Paul was. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul just devoured his Old Testament, right? His Testament at the time, that was all they had. They didn't have a New Testament. And when he writes to the church in Rome, Gentiles for the most part, he wants them to know that, that this same experience that the nation of Israel can experience with the temple here in Second Chronicles can be experienced by us as the church. In Romans chapter 5 verse 1, I just want to track through this because I see the parallels between Second Chronicles and Romans chapter 5 when... Paul writes to the church, he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Since we're justified, we're justified by faith, trusting Jesus, right? We have this peace with God. You should, you should experience peace with God all the time. When you understand that you're never going to be judged by God because of Christ. This is fantastic. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And notice he says, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice, right? We celebrate. We should be joyous people because of the grace of God. The hope that is found in the glory of God. And not only that, he says, and he says, there is more. It's like when you buy the Ginsu knives, you know? You know, they say, and you get the Ginsu knife, and, you, and there is more, you know? Like, Paul is excited here. He's saying there's a lot more. And he said, not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. All right, yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second. Whoa, whoa, whoa wait. Because we have our God. He can bring us through all these things that we're going to struggle with in this life. Everybody's going to go through stuff, right? But we can glory in tribulations knowing that the tribulation produces perseverance. The tribulations that we go through, what is it producing in us? Man, my, my, my mind is set on Jesus. I don't care what I'm going through. I'm just going to what? Persevere. I'm just going to keep going, man. I don't care what's happening around me. I'm going to persevere because I know what's waiting for me. This momentary light affliction, it's light affliction. It's working for us a far greater weight of glory, Paul says. So we're going to go through it, right? Tribulations. It, it's bringing perseverance. Perseverance, character. When we persevere in the Lord, what happens? Our character changes. 
We're not so like, oh, oh, right? Now we're starting to get stable. Now we're starting to go, you know what? It's okay. It's okay. Builds up your character. Character what? Produces what? Hope. Hope. We start to get rock shore. God's with me. I have this unshakable hope. I'm not going to be moved. Right? You see what he's saying here? Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Paul says this, the Holy, the Holy Spirit has been poured out. They're, they're worshiping the Lord in the temple and all of a sudden what comes down? The glory cloud, right? And they're just falling in love with God. This is what's happening to us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So for us too, we meditate on God's great love for us. And when we were still without strength, says verse 6, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Here is what makes this amazing. That just as the temple was set up, bringing in the ark, God pouring out his spirit, he's pouring it out into us. Notice it says there in verse 6, in due time. In due time. There's a time. When we experience that, we go, wow. This was the day. They're experiencing that at the temple. This is the day. God's being poured out. And Christ in us brings in a new era. For scarcely for a righteous man, verse 7, will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What's inside the ark? What's inside the ark? Judgment. But what's on top of the judgment? God's mercy, you see. While we were yet sinners, <laughs> we were in that ark, right? Christ died for us. Mercy. Mercy. It's amazing. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Jesus, through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We are now friends of God. We who were once enemies, we're now friends. And when we see ourselves as right before God, if we've received God's forgiveness, how can we leave here tonight? Verse 11 says what? And not only that, <laughs> there's more. But we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We have been made right with God. God comes down in the temple. They're celebrating. They're realizing how much God loves them. His mercy over their lives. And when we worship the Lord, he reveals himself to us. Glory come down. That's why we sang the song. Glory come down. As that temple was filled with the cloud, similar to the tabernacle in the Exodus. In Exodus chapter 40, when the people were before the Lord at the tabernacle, not the temple, not the temple, the tabernacle, it says, then the cloud, in Exodus 40, 34, the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. God came down at the tabernacle. God comes down at this temple. In 2 Chronicles, God comes down to the church. God comes down to us as individuals, as Christians. The cloud represents God moving in, so to speak. He's taking over. He says, I accept this. And, and you've got to understand, the cloud was a necessary veil, right? The cloud was necessary. Because we could not look at God and survive, right? If we ever, saw, if we ever approached God... Apart from Jesus Christ, what would happen? We'd be crispy critters. Just depends on how much fried you want to be, right? Fried to a crisp, right? Because no one can approach God and live, right? When Paul said to Timothy, and, and he says he speaks about the king of kings in 1 Timothy 6. He says he speaks about the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality dwelling, he says, in unapproachable light. God, is, you can't approach God. You need a covering, right? You need the, the, the asbestos suit, so to speak, right? 
Who's our asbestos? <laughs> Jesus Christ, right? You've got to put on Christ or else you can't approach God. There's no other way to approach God. You better be clothed in Christ. There's no other way to approach him. And yet God approaches his people in the temple through Jesus Christ. Exodus 40, 35 says this, I just find it fascinating. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because of the cloud that rested above it. There's, there's so many parallels here, right, between the tabernacle and the temple. He wasn't, appro he wasn't able to approach it because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle just as it filled the temple. Whenever the cloud was taken up, you guys know the story, when it was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys, but if the cloud was not taken up, they would hang out. Then they would, they would not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night in the sight of all Israel um, throughout all their journeys. Note that, throughout all their journeys. God was leading the nation of Israel. How? Through the cloud. His presence. His presence was with them. He'll lead us in all of our journeys. If we recognize him. It should be a joyous experience to walk with God. Right? The cloud led Israel. The cloud represented God's glory. His glory. Seeing God as glorious is the thing that leads a people of God. When we see him as glorious, the tabernacle, glory came and filled. Now the temple, glory came and filled. Oh, one more temple was filled, right? What was the tabernacle that was filled when John the Apostle wrote? John said in John chapter 1, verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now what's interesting with that word dwelt that word is tabernacle. Fascinating. The word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us, and we beheld his ah, glory. We beheld his glory. Just as we saw the glory of God in the tabernacle, just as we saw the glory of God in the temple, we see the glory of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? The temple. His temple. The glory is only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Then John, very interestingly, he notes in the second chapter of the Gospel of John, chapter 2, 19, Jesus answered and said to them, you know what? Destroy this temple. Right? You remember that? Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, eh, it took us 46 years to build this temple, and you're going you're gonna to raise it up in three days? John says what? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. The temple. Jesus Christ. So what we see in the Jewish temple in the Old Testament, we now see in the New Testament in Jesus Christ. So following the singing, following the glory cloud, what does Solomon do? Great time to preach a sermon. <laughs> That's why those Sundays are really special when the worship team, you know, there's just something happens. You guys know what I'm saying, right? There's some Sundays that are just different than other Sundays. Like something just, you know, why? Because just, I think we recognize God's presence. His presence is always with us. But there are just some days that you recognize him more. And the congregation is all jazzed and excited. And then I get up here and I'm like, yeah, this is great. You know, everybody's all excited. Worship was great. People are really fired up. Solomon takes note of that. He goes, okay, I'm going to preach a sermon. That's what he does. Solomon spoke. Chapter 6, verse 1. Solomon spoke. The Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell forever. And then the king turned and, he, and, and, and blessed the whole assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel was standing. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who has fulfilled with his hands what he spoke with his mouth to my father David. This was all by way of promise that God would come and dwell with his people, dwell in a temple when David built it, but David couldn't build it, right? So Solomon built it. 
just as the promise came. Since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I have chosen no city from any tribe of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there, nor did I choose any man to be ruler over my people Israel. Yet I have chosen Jerusalem. That's where God chose. That my name may be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. We looked at that last time we got together about the importance of Jerusalem. Right? The threshing floor. So what do we see in this sermon so far? God fulfills his word. Solomon points back and he says, God is faithful, guys, and he keeps his word. You can trust him. It's a powerful sermon. And God has chosen Jerusalem and God has chosen David. Solomon points back to Israel's past. God is faithful. And, and we need to always remember that, that no matter what we're going through, God is faithful. He could be trusted. He's faithful. He will keep his word. And now it was, verse 7, Solomon says, Now it was in the heart of my father David to build a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, Whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did, you did well, and that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build a temple, but your son who will come from your body, he shall build the temple for my name. So, Solomon says, So the Lord has fulfilled his word, which he spoke, and I have filled the position of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And I have built a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel, and there I have put the ark in which the covenant of the Lord, which he made with the children of Israel. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, spread out his hands, for Solomon had made a bronze platform so he could be seen, sort of like what we have here, this platform, made it five cubits by five cubits, three cubits high. That's pretty high. That's, uh, what's 18 inches times, what is it, times three? What is that? That's Five and a half feet, four and a half feet, four and a half feet. That's pretty high, four and a half feet. It's a pretty good platform. I'd hit my head on the ceiling. But he set it up there, and then he knelt down on his knees and before the, all the assembly, and he spread out his hands toward heaven, and he said, how does Solomon pray here? I, I, you know, a good way to pray is just start adoring God, adoration, right? Great way to st start praying to God. And he says to God, he says, Lord God of Israel, there's no God in heaven. Or on earth like you. And keep your covenant in mercy with your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. Solomon prays a great prayer. He starts with adoration. There's no one like you. Right? We sing the song sometimes, right? There is none like you. No one else can do the things like you do. And then he says here in this sermon, he says, You have kept what you promised your servant David, my father. You have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, now keep what you have promised your servant David, my father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man sit before you on the throne of Israel. Only if, only if your sons take heed to their way, that they walk in my law as you have walked before me. Note those words. It'll continue if, if you walk before me. It's not only hearing, but it's by walking what we hear. <laughs> That's where the blessings come. When Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, chapter 2, verse 10, he says, we are his workmanship, right? It's the word poema. God is writing a poem with our lives. We are his workmanship. And what were we created for? We were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God pre prepared beforehand, what? That we should walk in them, right? We're, we're supposed to also walk what we hear. God promised us Solomon, if you... If you Walk before me, you'll, be, you'll do well. 
And now, O Lord God of Israel, let your word come true, which you have spoken to your servant David. But will God indeed dwell with men on earth? It's a great question. Behold, heaven in the heavens, heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. Humility. Solomon, at this very moment in his life, we're going to see he kind of stumbles a little bit. But right here he acknowledges nothing can contain God. No matter what we build, it will never be sufficient to contain God. God is never in a box, right? God is way outside any box that we may try to put him in. Yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication, verse 19. He asked God to hear his supplication, O Lord my God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you, that your eyes may be open toward this temple day and night, toward the place where you have said you would put your name, that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes toward this place. And may you hear the supplication, supplications of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place, hear from heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. So now we're seeing, you know, the temple is also not only for a place of sacrifice, but it's also a place of prayer. It's supposed to be a place of prayer. When you hear, forgive. We pray through our temple, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we come to the Father, we pray who? We pray through Christ. Right? Hear our prayer, O God. Right? And if anyone sins, he goes on, verse 22, if anyone sins against his neighbor and is forced to take an oath and comes and takes an oath before your altar in this temple, then hear from heaven and act and judge your servants, bringing retribution on the wicked by bringing his way on his own head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. Or if your people Israel are defeated before an enemy because they have sinned, See, the implication over and over and over again in these, what we're reading, is that Israel's going to sin, right? So he says, if your people are defeated before the enemy because they have sinned against you and return and confess your name and pray and make supplication before you in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land which you gave them and their fathers. So when we sin, what do we do? We, we come and pray to God and... He will forgive us. Very important to note. When the heavens are shut up because there is no rain, because they have sinned against you. When they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, that you may teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. So when they when they sin against God, okay, and God brings a judgment of what? The heavens being shut up, right? There's no rain because they have sinned. Solomon says, when we come back to you, Lord, here, and forgive us. When there's famine in the land, in verse 28, all these things that are going to come against Israel, pestilence, blight, mildew, locusts, grasshoppers, and their enemies besiege them in the land of their cities, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, you know, because we've sinned, God will bring a judgment against the nation of Israel. We'll see this unfold as we continue in the reading of the historical uh, nation of Israel. But whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone or by all your people, when each one knows his own burden and his own grief and spreads out his hands to the temple, hear from uh, heaven, your dwelling place, and forgive, he says. And give to everyone according to all his ways, whose heart you know. For you alone know the hearts of the sons of men, that they may fear you to walk in your ways, and as long as they live in the land which you gave to our fathers. Moreover, concerning a foreigner who is not of your people Israel. You see, and again, the nation of Israel was to be a light, unto the Gentiles. The nation of Israel was supposed to be a light to all people, not only to the nation of Israel. What happened? The nation of Israel started to just become inward. They stopped going out and shedding the light to the, to the other people around them, the foreigners, right? They were supposed to be a light to everybody. 
So here it is again. Solomon says concerning a foreigner who is not of your people Israel but has come from a far country for the sake of your great name and mighty hand of your outstretched arm. When they come and pray in this temple, then hear from heaven. You see that? Even the foreigner could come into Jerusalem and pray towards God. And Solomon says, hear from heaven, Lord. Hear from heaven. Your dwelling place. And do according to all which the foreigner calls to you, that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, and do your, and, and, and do your people Israel, and, 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 and that they may know that this temple which I have built is called by your name. And when your people go out to battle against their enemies, whatever, wherever you send them, and when they pray to cry to the city which you have chosen and the temple which you have built for your name, hear from heaven. Hear from heaven their prayer and supplication and maintain their cause. And verse 36, and when they sin against you, <laughs> and he says it right here, now he's starting to realize, wow, okay. We all fall short. And then there's parentheses. The, the chronicler writes this. He said, for there is no one who does not sin. Notice that. Right? Solomon's making this prayer. And he realizes, he says, Lord, everyone sins. When they sin against you, there's none who does not sin. And you become angry with them and deliver them to the enemy and they take their... And they take them captive to a land far or near. Again, the nation of Israel, they're going to be pulled away, right? They're going to be drawn away by the Babylonians, right? They're going to be taken away from their land. Yet when they come to themselves, look at verse 37. I love that. When they come to themselves, when they do one of these, like, what, what are we thinking? Why, why did we do this? You know, like... Where have we been? What have we been doing? When they come to themselves in the land where they carried them captive and repent. Now, it's one thing to go, what did I do? What did I do? What did I? But it's another thing to repent and say, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> That's the difference between just smacking yourself in the head and, and saying, why did this happen to me? Repentance is when we say, okay, but I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> I'm going to turn a new leaf. I'm going to go a different direction. I'm going to start to follow God. He says, and when they repent and make supplication to you in the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned, we have done wrong, and have committed wickedness. When they're drug off into other lands, nation of Israel, they're going to lose their land. When they come to themselves, and when they return to you with all their heart, notice that in verse 38, and with all their soul, in the land of that captivity where they have been carried captive and pray toward their land which you have gave, given to their fathers, the city which you have chosen and toward the temple which I have built for your name, then hear from heaven your dwelling place, their prayer, their supplications, and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Now my eyes, God, I pray, let your eyes be open and let your ears be attentive to the prayer made in this place. Solomon makes this beautiful prayer. So when Israel has a need or when Israel needs to repent, Solomon says, God hears us. That's, that's, what we're, that's all that we read. In any way, shape, or form that you have fallen short of God's glory and you repent because God hears. God always takes back sinful man. He will always take you back when you repent. And just as Jesus tells us in the prodigal son, right? It says the prodigal son. In, in the prodigal son story, you know, the, the, the kid wants money from his dad. And he goes to a, to a foreign land. He, he wastes his money on prodigal living. And what does it say there? In, in Luke chapter 15, verse 17, he says, But when he came to himself, right? He was like, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish here? I, I know what I'm going to do. In verse 18, I will rise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. That's called confession. That's a heart that says, I want to change. I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to repent. And what did the father do? He didn't even hear the confession. What did the father do? Just wrapped himself around the kid. 
right? Put a cloak back on him. Put shoes on his feet, right? Put the ring back on the, the kid's finger. Killed the fatted calf. Had a big party, right? They celebrated. That's repentance. Fall short, just go back. There was one uh, beautiful statement by a commentator. He says, you know, it's, it's, it's not enough to say I'm sorry and repent. It's not enough to say, I'm sorry, and repent, and then to go on afterwards just as you always went. So vital. To make that turn, to make that, you know, this is my direction. This is where I'm going. Now, therefore, arise, O Lord God, to your resting place, place. You in the ark of your strength, let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation and let your saints rejoice in goodness. O Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Remember the mercies of your servant David. And then Solomon finished praying. Chapter 7, verse 1, And fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering. After he prayed this prayer, the fire came down, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And when it says filled the temple, in, in the Hebrew it means it filled the, he filled the temple and he, and he kept filling the temple. It wasn't a one-time deal. He kept filling the temple of God. And here is a picture of God accepting Solomon's prayer. He accepted Solomon's prayer and Solomon's sacrifice. The same thing happened in Leviticus chapter 9 when Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting, came out and blessed the people and then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they all shouted and they fell on their faces. Same thing. Same things that happens at, at the tabernacle, at the temple. Right? They fall to their faces. And verse 2 says, And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement. Same thing, like Leviticus 9, right? It's the same thing. And they praised the Lord. And what did they say? Well, they went back to the song. Oh, man, he is so good. <laughs> For he is good. They started shouting out, He is good. His mercy endures forever. The people now start... Now the people are singing what the Levites, the worship team sang. Now not only the, the Levites were singing, but now all the people are singing the same story. He is singing the same song. He is good. His mercy endures forever. And then the king in verse 4. And all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 bulls, 100,000 uh, and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated all the house of God. So there's sacrifice going on at the temple. There's dedication going on at the temple. There is prayer going on at the temple. That's a, that's a good place to be, right? Dedication, sacrifice, prayer. And the priests attended to their services, the Levites also with their instruments, the music of the Lord, which King David had made for praise of the Lord for his mercy endures forever. There it is again. They just can't stop singing it. They're just amazed. At the mercy seat, right? The mercy. Even though we fall short of God, God's glory and all that judgment is in the Ark of the Covenant, yet over the... It's the mercy. I love that. It just, it just fills me with joy to realize my sins have forgiven me. And whenever David offered praise by their ministry, the priests sounded trumpets out beside, opposite them while all his, Israel stood. Now they're full, full blown celebration. Furthermore, Solomon consecrated the middle of the court that was in the house of, of the Lord. And there he offered burnt offerings and fat and peace offerings, which the bronze altar, which Solomon had made, was not able to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat. And it was at that time Solomon kept the feast seven days. Seven? They did this for seven days? Seven days. That's a feast. That's a worship time, right? I, I do too, Danny. I wish I was there. Seven days. Celebration, offerings, worship. 
and all Israel with him, a great assembly from the entrance of Hamat to the brook Egypt. And on the eighth day, they held a sacred assembly, for they observed the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. Ah, but alas, all good things come to an end. On the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people away to their tents. Right? Every great worship service, every great encounter with God, right? You have those mountaintop experiences with God, those, you know, God just fills everything. You just, you get a sense of who he is and where he, you know, just everything. And then all of a sudden it's like, mm, got to end. He sent them all away to their tents. But how did they go? How did they go? Joyful. Look at those words. Joyful, glad of heart. Why? For the good that the Lord had done for David, for Solomon, and for his people Israel. You know, Nehemiah 8.10 says, The joy of the Lord is what? Our strength. Understanding who God is, what he has done for you. Even though, you know, I've done this and I've done that and I've done this. He says, come back. Just come back. Repent of it. Turn from it and leave how? Joyful. Joyful with praise. Oh, God, you're so good. Your mercy endures forever, God. You take me back. In spite of who I am, you love me. So thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord in the king's house. Verse 11, Solomon successfully accomplished all that came into his heart to make in the house of the Lord in his own house. And then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, you know, I heard your prayer. <laughs> I love that. Verse 12, I heard your prayer. And I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. God says to Solomon, you know, it, everything that you did, I'm accepting. I'm accepting it. Solomon made the temple, God accepts it. God accepts this glorious building, the sacrifices that are going on. God says, I approve. He put his seal of approval on it. He says, I'm accepting it. So the temple was accepted for worship, but also for prayer. And verse 13 says, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land, the pestilences among my people, if my people, ah, uh, there it is, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. You hear this verse all the time, right? Such a hopeful verse. No matter how much a people may sin, if they repent, turn, then God will hear that people. Where there is sin, grace is there to forgive. Where sin is, grace abounds even more. But humility is, the, is vital. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray. Notice that. This verse is the wipe the slate clean verse, so to speak. So anyone who thinks the Old Testament is just, the, uh, it's just a different God, he's a wrathful God, and he's different from the God of the New Testament. I hear that all the time. This verse shows different, doesn't it? God is always looking to be gracious to his people. Go further back. For the grace, when we saw Moses ask God to reveal himself, when, when it was, Moses said, you know, Lord, I just want to see you. I, 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 you know, I, I, I hear from you. I know you're speaking to me, but I want to see your glory, Moses said. And, Moses, and God said to Moses, Moses, I, you, I can't, I can't do that. I can't show you who I am. Why? Because again, you'd be crispy critters. You'd be fried right on the spot. But I'll tell you what I'm going to show you, Moses. I'll show you my hind parts. I'm going to pass by you. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to pass by you. And there I'll pro proclaim my name. So Moses only saw the backside of God, so to speak. And it was there that God pro professed his name. And he said, the Lord, the God, merciful and gracious. That's just the backside of God. Could you imagine the front side of God? If that's the back part of God. That he's gracious, he's merciful, he's long-suffering, we're looking to forgive us. If that's only his back part, could you imagine his front part when we see him in glory? We're going to be blown away. We're going to be completely blown away. 
So Solomon says, now my eyes will be open, my ears attentive to prayer made in this place for now. I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be forever there. My eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, <laughs> if you walk before me as your father David walked and do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I have covenanted with David your father. You shall not fail to have a man as ruler in Israel. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I've set before you, and go and serve other gods, which he will, and, <laughs> and, and, and then I will uproot them from my land, which I have given them, and this house, which I have sanctified for my name, I will cast out of my sight, and will make it a proverb and a byword among all people. And as for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it shall be astonished and say, why has the Lord done this to this, to this house in this land? Like, why, why would this happen? And then they will answer, well, because they forsook the Lord their God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and embraced other gods and worshipped them and served them. Uh, therefore, he has brought all this calamity against them. That's the way it ends. Here's the challenge. If you walk, <laughs> verse 17, he's telling Solomon, if you walk with me, it's going to be great. But if you turn from me, it's not going to be so good. It's that simple. You know, we, we make our theology very complicated. We try to, you know, make it complicated so that we could talk ourselves out of living for God and living rightly before God. But God doesn't do that, does he? He says, if you walk with me, it's going to be great, Solomon. But if you turn from me, it's not going to be so good. Solomon doesn't walk with God. Doesn't turn out too good for him. Right? God doesn't want us to sin, yet we will. And in 1 John 2, 2 says, My little children, these things I have written to you so that you may not sin. I mean, we read these words. We read the Bible so that we could say, wow, I don't want to sin. I hear you, Lord. I hear what you're saying to me tonight. Maybe there's something we got to turn from tonight. This is the night. I don't, I don't, I don't want to sin. But then John says this, and if anyone sins, well, he acknowledges we're going to fall short. But it doesn't give us the license to sin. It's not like we could deliberately sin and just say, okay, I'll repent of it, and, and then I'll do it again the next day. That's not how it works. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, he's the payment for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. We all fall short. And yet there's that mercy seat, guys. Claim the mercy of God. Get right with him. Whatever may be hindering you from walking with God, just turn from it. Claim his mercy, claim his forgiveness, and walk with him. Father, we thank you for this amazing picture that you have placed before us. Lord, this, this amazing temple and the bringing in of the, the Ark of the Covenant and, and all the falling short of your people that is in the Ark, Lord, all that judgment that's represented there. And yet on top of it was the beautiful mercy seat, Father. Thank you. And Lord, we thank you for your mercy seat, the Lord Jesus Christ, in our life. Oh, God, you're so good. You are so good, Lord. And your mercies are new every morning. Every day, God. May we always wake up and, and see your mercies, Lord. And that we might claim you as our very own. And that we would not only just claim you with our lips, but that you would have our heart and that we would walk with you, Lord. That we would enjoy your presence. That we would meditate on who you are. That we recognize your greatness over our lives. We pray that that glory would come down and fill us afresh and anew. Dear God, pour out your spirit. 
Fill us, Lord, with your love and your grace and your mercy. Thank you for this night. And thank you for this word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.